So this is a Pokemon video essay, yeah, which means that this video should start on a black screen. Then we should hear the opening theme for Pokemon Red and Blue as a montage of scenes from different games appears. And then I say something big and thoughtful, like, Pokemon, have you heard of it? But that's not happening, because the answer to that question is yes, of course. Pokemon is one of the most recognizable and celebrated brands in the world. For nearly 30 years, the world has been fascinated by the video games, anime, trading card game, and all the surrounding properties that Pokemon has spawned. And for those same 30 years, we've been deluged in facts, mysteries, creatures, and the worlds that are part of this franchise. In case you haven't guessed, I like Pokemon quite a lot, actually. Since playing Pokemon Pearl upon release, I played at least one game in every single generation. Gone back to play Emerald, the aforementioned Pearl, then Platinum, Heart Gold, Soul Silver, Black, White, X, Y, Omega Ruby, Alpha Sapphire, Ultra Moon, Shield, Legends Arceus, even Shining Pearl. I've got a mix of emotions and opinions on these games from a variety of perspectives, but there's obviously something that keeps me coming back. I'll be playing Scarlet soon, so there's no fear that I won't continue playing the series anytime soon. So yes, I'm a fan of Pokemon, but I'm also a fan of storytelling. I know that the Pokemon fandom has a lot of strong opinions on how the franchise interacts with storytelling, and given the title of this video, I bet you can guess that I'm not here to temper those feelings. In fact, let me make this clear from the beginning. I'll be taking a look at the world of Pokemon from an exclusively world-building perspective. I'll be discussing the stories and lore that are revealed throughout the Pokemon main series video games because they help provide insight to the world of Pokemon, but I won't be passing judgment on any of those particular stories or the executions of them in the games. I also tend to ramble a lot and let the scope of these videos get wildly out of hand, so the Pokemon focus of this video will come in and out of you as we journey together through all of history and fiction, looking for answers to questions that may seem irrelevant to a series of video games mainly designed to release new varieties of electric rodents every three years or so. But today, with the release of a brand new generation of Pokemon looming, hopefully riding the hype of the fandom, I want to take a look at how the world of Pokemon was built all those years ago. I want to take some time to dissect the magic of Pokemon and show just how fundamentally fractured the core tenets of the Pokemon world are. Because Pokemon's world building isn't just flawed, it's actively broken in a way that could never be repaired. Hi, my name is Volcaronite, and today I'm going to be taking a look at magic, world building, and Pokemon's biggest failure. Before we go any further, let's take some time to establish the reality of the Pokemon world so that we can understand what it looks like. Pokemon takes place in a world similar to our own. Technological development is pretty much identical. Human migration and settlement patterns seem to match up. Sovereign states, local cities, cultures, and societies all seem to be mostly equivalent to those in the real world. The Pokemon games all take place in a region, which usually seems to be fairly independent from the other regions of the world, though some are more interconnected than others. Kanto and Johto, for example, are physically connected. We know of a Pokemon nation, which includes those two regions, as well as Hoenn and Sinnoh, though the regions and cultures were conceived using some explicit real-world inspirations, the world of Pokemon is most certainly a different one to Earth. Asterisk. There are two notable exceptions to the similarities between Earth and the Pokemon world. The first is the general condition of human society in the Pokemon world. Basically, the Pokemon world is very utopic in comparison to Earth. Cities are fewer and cleaner, politics and conflict are all but non-existent, the environment is much cleaner, people are friendlier and happier, even crime is infrequent. A lot of this probably comes from the fact that the world of Pokemon seems to have far fewer people living in it than there are here on Earth. There's no real way to estimate this number, though there are Pokemon sites that have tried to cast out a guess. But whatever this cause is, the malevolent forces of human societies on Earth are just less powerful in the Pokemon world. Societal problems aren't non-existent, of course, but the world is generally considered safe enough to let adolescent children wander and explore it independently. The second key difference, of course, is the existence of Pokemon. Pokemon, short for pocket monsters, are the creatures that inhabit the Pokemon world. It's hard to get a precise definition of what a Pokemon is, but I'm going to take my best shot and say that any creature that meets the following criteria can be considered a Pokemon. 
Pokemon have an innate ability to create and manipulate magical elements and energies like electricity, water, ground, and psychic auras. They have intelligence higher than that of common earth animals, allowing for concepts to be understood and for complex commands to be executed. Pokemon have the innate ability to bond with humans, and Pokemon are not themselves better considered to be humans. I think this is a decent list. It's definitely worth noting that there are Pokemon fans who have attempted to analyze the Pokemon world and media for a better understanding of the kinds of energies and creatures that exist, and so might have a better way of defining the term Pokemon. But for the purposes of this video, this definition will serve as useful enough. Pokemon and humans inhabit this world together. Pokemon seem to mostly take the place of ordinary animals, which may or may not exist in the Pokemon world depending on the source, and plants, which do exist. However, human culture and technology has largely developed to orbit the existence of Pokemon. Most technologies are at least adjacent to Pokemon. Transit, healthcare, commerce, communication, all of these things are tied to Pokemon. That is because the primary tenet of this world, the single concept that fuels everything, is that humans can capture, train, and battle with these Pokemon. The wild creatures can be caught and tamed with a device called a Pokeball, trained to learn certain skills called moves, and then are used to battle other kind of Pokemon in a kind of wrestling cockfighting hybrid. Most of the culture and industry of the world, or at least that which you can explore in the games, is designed to facilitate, monetize, and grow the Pokemon fighting and training that happens in the world. The people who capture, train, and fight with Pokemon are called trainers. Those fights are called battles. Industries include sophisticated public health care for Pokemon, substantial commerce selling tools for trainers to capture and enhance their Pokemon with unique traits and techniques, and many national competition structures that host trainers from specific regions of the world as they overcome certain challenges. Trainers of all ages are expected to gamble on their matches, with the spoils going to the victor. Architecture and infrastructure is designed around, for, and sometimes even with Pokemon. Even criminal organizations are usually focused on the capture and abuse of Pokemon. Pokemon are involved in everything. If you've played even a single Pokemon game, none of this is news to you. In each of the mainline Pokemon games, you play as a young trainer. You take on the challenge of the Pokemon League in the region, whatever that is. Through the course of the game, you capture and train Pokemon, usually thwart a criminal organization as a child, and then become the best trainer in the region. Again, none of this should be unfamiliar to you if you're familiar with these games. All of these games take place in a world that's, as previously mentioned, technologically and societally similar to our own, perhaps somewhat more advanced even. You're allowed to access an internet-connected computer that can digitally store the Pokemon creatures and, in later games, can be accessed and manipulated with a smartphone that itself is possessed by a Pokemon. Building and power infrastructure are very similar to ours in the real world. Cars and trucks exist, though all regions are designed to be easily traversable by walking and biking. Energy is usually created through either renewable sources or through unearthed resources. Fossil fuels, gases, some more magical sources that are still found underground. For anyone who plays these games, whether they're familiar with Pokemon or not, the worlds will feel very familiar. But this is strange. After all, the Pokemon games don't take place in our world. It's a different world, one with magic in it. This makes the Pokemon series one that is definitionally a high fantasy RPG. You play the role of a trainer exploring a magical world separate from our own. You encounter creatures of fantastical capabilities, capturing and training them for battle. Surely this is a world filled with magic and feats of mystical wonder, no? No. The world is intensely familiar. You travel along roads either on foot or perhaps on bike. You travel between cities sprawling and industrial, with power lines connecting skyscrapers all built by humans. Power plants and energy sources are often crucial to the stories of Pokemon games, if not pivotal locations of their regions independent of any story. Just about every other high fantasy RPG is stuck in the past. Strolling through the worlds of Skyrim or Breath of the Wild, you're stuck in that past. Those few modernities aren't really modern, they're the result of magic in the world. The tech isn't really tech. but Pokemon, a series with magic far more powerful than pivotal than any of that of Skyrim or Zelda or The Witcher or really any other world, is loaded with technology. Pokemon seem to be able to do as much for the world as any technology humans have ever developed can, and yet the world exists mostly unchanged. This is a pretty easy observation to make, and it leads to a pivotal question about worlds both real and fiction. Why does technology exist?
You may think this is kind of a strange question to ask, especially in a video about Pokemon, magical creatures, but it's valid and crucial to the point. So let's take some time to think about why development of technology ever began. There's a whole host of reasons you may be thinking of right now. Maybe it's to make bigger and better things possible. Maybe it's to make life safer and easier for everyone. Maybe it's to save lives or to take lives. It could be to explore the world more easily or to better tell stories or even to help people dream. Is technological development just the idle pastime of some brilliant recluses? All of this is true, in part, and all of it is wrong. Sure, technology does all of these things and, as time has flowed, each of these may have been the stated goal. Certainly, when we think of technology now, we mostly consider the ways it can improve and extend the lives of people, or how rich maniacs can use technology to further their fever dreams. But if we think back, way back, to the original technologies, things like fire and the wheel, what were they actually made for? Think simply and somewhat cynically, and the answer will seem quite obvious. They were made so rich people had to do less work. Fire, of course, solved multiple problems for which most pre-fire peoples had no concern. Challenges like how do we see in the dark, and how do we make our extra food last longer, are not problems that most people had to deal with before fire. Most would eat their gathered or hunted food on the same day it was obtained. They usually didn't have enough food to warrant research into preservation. Seeing in the dark, similarly, was not something most needed to do. By the time night fell, they'd have returned to their homes and would be ready to sleep. The dark was a message. Don't be awake now. Let's jump forward in time. The wheel solved the problem of how to move heavy things, or a lot of things in fewer trips than carrying them. Affixing wheels to platforms allowed those platforms to be moved simply by pushing them, reducing the friction of the ground and making it much easier for humans to move larger, heavier loads. The wheel, along with the reach-extending rope, created pulleys and catapults, which allowed for the vertical movement of loads. Of course, at the base, all of these problems are concepts that are easy to conceive of independent of their technological solutions. The problem of seeing in the dark is not exclusive to those people who require a solution, nor is the problem of moving heavy things. The problems were very human, of course. It's the solution that were found with technology. There are solutions to each of these problems that don't require technology, just more manpower. How do you move heavy things? Get a lot of people to work together. How do you have edible food for later? Get people to bring fresh food to you whenever you need it. How do you navigate in the dark? Don't. Do everything you need to do in the light, perhaps with the help of others, so you are able to complete everything you need to do. There's no such thing as a problem without a solution. The solutions might not be good or useful or even possible, but they do exist. Technology simply exists as, usually, an easier solution. Imagine you're an ancient Egyptian pharaoh. You're powerful, busy, and vain. You see that the pharaohs before you have each had their subjects create monuments to their own power and excellence. Your subjects can also see these things, so you need a way to show your own power and excellence is far in excess of your predecessors. So how do you do this? Well, you conceive of a structure, a pyramid, a monolithic triangle visible for miles to host your house and your body once your life leaves you. But the problem is this. There's no way a pyramid can be built by hand before you die. Sure, you know that you're going to live forever in the afterlife, but your subjects can't see you there. Plus, that means that there's a chance you'll be forgotten in this world. So you need something to speed up the creation of a pyramid so that when you die, it's ready for you to rest in. You've got practically unlimited manpower and unchecked power on them. So besides those people who are needed for farming and for processing food, workforce isn't an issue. But even with the entire population of cities dedicated to building your pyramid, it still can't be done soon enough. The Materials can be gathered and built, so these stone blocks are no problem, but they just can't be lifted fast enough, especially as the height of the pyramid increases. And even if they are lifted at sufficient speeds, they just as often either collapse from the stress or fall, usually killing several workers in the process. The loss of workers is no problem on a small scale, of course, so you don't care much about a small rate of failure, but you're looking at something like one in four of your workers dying while the pyramid is still in early construction. This is unacceptable. So how do you solve this? Well. If the blocks don't need to be lifted, then they're much less likely to fall and kill workers. So instead of lifting them up to the other steps of the pyramid as it's constructed, you have the workers to construct a long, thin, artificial hill to push the blocks up. This hill allows for the blocks to be moved much faster and safer than simply lifting them up layer by layer. 
This is the advent of the ramp. Eventually, it's learned that the ramp can be used for things other than the construction of opulent tombs for the rich. It's good for moving food and water around a small region without having to carry buckets or baskets. It makes for an excellent way to scale small changes in elevation on foot. It's the very first development in a series of technologies that are all designed to transport loads vertically. Levers, then wheels, pulleys, elevators, cranes. All of them stem from that original desire to move loads vertically. But now, let's imagine that you're that same pharaoh with the same desire for a monument to your magnificence. The only difference this time is that you have a warlock on your side. This person shows you that if you pour human blood over the object you need moved, he's capable of effortlessly transporting it where it needs to go. Now, you have two options. Either ignore this warlock's power and valiantly continue along the path that you can already see is fruitless, or use his power to help build your tomb. Obviously, this isn't a question. You use the warlock's power, a power that can comfortably be described as magic. You gather as many of these warlocks as you can find and set them to work. You create a temple for bloodletting all non-warlock subjects of your kingdom and require them to sacrifice a unit of blood every moon. Your pyramid gets built, perhaps faster and more opulently than it would have been without the aid of magic. All it took was the enlistment of your warlocks. In this illustration, magic is solving the problems of rich people, allowing them to work less. This, of course, is precisely what technology does in our world. Because magic doesn't exist in our world, rich people had to commission the development of other solutions to those same problems. How do you get ideas and stories to be understood in the distant reaches of your kingdom? Well, you need a way to have those stories spread and understood. Develop the printing press, distribution systems, literacy instructors, and get those stories spreading. But what if instead there was a siren that could be heard by everyone for a thousand miles? Just employ her to tell the stories and skip all the infrastructure. And I could go on with more examples, but they all illustrate the same conclusion. Magic is the antithesis to technology. Magic can take the place of technology in every world because it's an easier solution. It's easier to force someone to cast a spell than it is to develop, design, and distribute a brand new invention from the ground up. Okay, winged fire bug man, you say to me, that's all well and good, but what does this have to do with Pokemon? Well, Pokemon are magic. As I explained earlier, Pokemon are creatures that are defined by their superior intelligence to earth animals and their ability to manipulate elemental energies in a way that could be comfortably described as magic. Pokemon are capable of solving the issues we've discussed here. Wheels aren't necessary when you've got big sumo wrestling animals that can carry anything you need. There's no need for pipes or plumbing when the average crab can create water from nothing. You don't need a horse and buggy when your horse is faster than most cars, which itself is unnecessary when a floating cat can teleport you anywhere you need. Of course, this is animals doing the work of both humans and machines. This happened in the real world, too. Animals were domesticated and technologies were developed to aid those animals. Eventually, the tech took on a life of its own and succeeded the animals entirely. But it started with those animals. Aside from the very basics, like fire and planting food, every piece of technology was made with the express goal of heightening the capabilities of animals. Really, domestication was one of the first large-scale technological development steps humans took part in. This, of course, would have been exactly the same in Pokemon. The only difference would be that the animals were magical. Tech still could have come from heightening the possibilities of Pokemon, right? One of the oldest, richest traditions of storytelling critique is the discussion on how stories involving magic and monsters all take place in the same tired setting, a stereotypical setting much like medieval Europe, typically England. They take place in a time before the Enlightenment and after the fall of the Roman Empire. It's a time with simple mechanical contraptions like levers and pulleys. Catapults, crossbows, and cranes are the most advanced machines. No gunpowder, no metals more advanced than steel, no metal workers more skilled than smiths. Swords and spears are the primary weapons of warfare, and horses are the primary type of transportation. The cities of these worlds are wooden and stone affairs, with streets being cramped and closed, pedestrians and animals roaming indiscriminately. The cities dwarf the next biggest settlements, villages. Connecting roads are dirt and well-traveled. It's easy to say that this setting is overused. From Lord of the Rings to Game of Thrones, The Witcher to The Elder Scrolls, some of the finest franchises in fantasy fiction have all settled on the same sort of style. All of these fantastical settings and more come from different authors and creators, yet they all have the same blood and veins running through them. Fiction seems to love this trope so much that one of the best-known comedies is a parody of medieval fantasy. So yes, it's easy to say that this is an overused setting. The harder question is, of course, why? 
Lots of people will present easy answers to this question. Most of them stem from some of the struggles of modern storytelling in pop cultures, that everyone is influenced and or stealing from older, better authors, or that the Eurocentric focus of pop culture and storytelling is a symptom of the whitewashing of history. There's a lot of truth to these answers, to be sure, and I'm not going to downplay those forces. There are, however, other reasons that the magical fantasy settles in medieval society, and it all has to do with the powers and abilities that magic provides to the world. As we've now firmly established, magic in the world works in direct opposition to technology. In the worlds that have magic, you can basically map technological stagnation to the prevalence of magic. Let's take a look at some extremes. In the magical world of the Harry Potter franchise, the sect of magic users seems to be very, very small. It's tough to get a precise figure. I guess not every fantasy author likes to create worldwide demographic analyses of their fictional universe, but it's small enough that the existence of magic is kept a secret from the wide world. Of course, because Harry Potter takes place in the recent-ish past, with the rest of the world being naive to the magical world, its technological development is unchanged. It's a low fantasy, taking place in the modern world. Interestingly, the design of the regions where magic is freely and openly used are all quite medieval in nature, from the gothic spires of Hogwarts to the cramped clutter of Diagon Alley. Wherever magic users exist, the structures they build seem to be stuck in the past. Game of Thrones is on the far end of this. Magic on Planetos is strong, very strong. Strong. The Targaryen dynasty was built atop the backs of dragons, powerful, magical weapons of warfare. Through sheer destructive energy and mobility, this incestuous family of lizard warlocks was able to hold in their fist an entire continent for hundreds of years. Westeros, as it succumbed, was thrown into scientific stasis. Then, once the Targaryens lost their dragons, their power began to weaken. We saw the advent of wildfire, this world's gunpowder equivalent. We see the first trappings of medicinal and mechanical advances. The Targaryens are even overthrown. As the magic of the world weakened, the science of the world began to advance to fill the gap. Game of Thrones is actually a good analogy for Pokemon, because both worlds' magic systems are largely fueled by humans that aren't inherently magical, but control creatures with apocalyptically strong magical capabilities. Both do have humans with magical control, to be sure, but most of the magical feats are facilitated by magical creatures under the control of humans. Both have detailed histories and relationships with their magical creatures, with myths about how their ancestors and the humans that controlled them may even share common ancestor, thus explaining the magical connection. Let's just keep this in mind for the time being. The domestication of animals is one of the very first steps towards technological advancement that a civilization will take. Where there are animals to tame and breed, there are people to gather near their habitats and use them. The Dawn of Beasts of Burden worked because humans are physically limited but exceedingly clever. They can see that animals are stronger, faster, hardier, and less lazy than even the most driven of humans. A well-trained human with the goal to walk empty-handed could regularly walk a marathon a day. A horse bred for carrying a rider and saddlebags full of goods can double that while leaving the human rider with enough energy to conduct themselves at their destination. Oxes help in farming. Cows and pigs do too, in a different way. Dogs are able to loyally defend their owners. These beasts of burden can do what humans cannot, work tirelessly. Domestication is a sort of specialization. By outsourcing certain tasks to those creatures that can perform those tasks better, humans are able to more aptly focus on what they can do best. Now, in our world, Animals aren't really tireless and limitless. They need food, water, and shelter as much as humans do. They're bound by the same rules and laws as humans are. So, these burden tasks were eventually given to machines that could perform them better than the animals. The richest, most prolific of societies were able to collect their greatest minds together to craft something stronger than the animals. The relatively low skill ceiling of real animals forced humans, ever the clever and lazy species, to find better solutions. When we talked earlier about the technologies that humans would create, it was those that were inspired by animals that were created first. Wheels allowed the inventions to be pulled by animals easier than dragging sledges might be, for example. Example, technology raises the skill ceiling of animals. But magic can raise the skill ceiling of animals too. As the dragons of Game of Thrones show us, dragon riders are equipped with creatures that are not only capable of traveling the length of a continent in a day, but forging structures much larger and sturdier than humans ever could on their own. Dragon riding and taming, just like horseback riding and taming, is a form of specialization. Their domestication led to a civilization that was more advanced than the rest. Not through science, 
because they had no need for further advancement when their magic was already so powerful. But when we take this logic and look at Pokemon, we start to see the problem. Many of the creatures of the Pokemon are at least as powerful as those of Game of Thrones, yet we still see the world exist as it does for us in the real world. Cities are constructed by people and machines, despite the fact that 30-foot log steel serpents capable of forging towering walls of rock and stone are tamed by 10-year-olds. Airports with metal airplanes continue to ferry people in transit even though baby dragons are handed out to children on the daily, and taxi services use local bird species like if Ubercopter was successful. And, most egregious of all, roads are filled with semis and port cities load cargo ships full despite the fact that creatures capable of effortlessly teleporting themselves and their surroundings are native to just about every region in the world. Why do transit companies and taxi service and conveyor belts exist when infinite, free, effortless teleportation can be accessed by anybody with a 200 yen pokeball and a modicum of patience? So here, we have finally come to the crux of the problem. Teleportation breaks modern civilization. Not just a little bit. The existence of teleportation completely shatters basically every single development of humanity. Every single advancement of science and civilization was made with the transportation of goods, people, or information in mind. Villages, then towns, then cities, then nations are all the result of humans, with a wide variety of needs, gathering around those vital resources. The humans specialize in collecting those resources, then trade amongst themselves. Port cities on rivers and oceans exist because ships are better able to travel goods than horses or people. The first mode of transportation humans outsourced to machines wasn't land-based, but water-based. There's no horse of the sea after all, so humans needed another way across. Ships became the best tool for transiting people and goods. Even for locations connected by land, ships were safer, faster, and more reliable than horse-drawn carriages. But with teleportation, the benefits of the ship stop existing. Living on the water, in total, becomes much less valuable. Why not just set your home wherever your parents do, or wherever you want, and teleport the goods to your location? And just like that, there goes transportation. Cars, bikes, carriages, horses, rails, roads, paths, bridges, is all of them gone, all of them unnecessary. How about passing information? The internet, television, telephone, telegraph, printing press, all of the inventions that were created to succeed oral storytelling? Well, the weaknesses of oral storytelling are caused by loss of human memory over time. Small victories turn into heroic stories of gods and men over the years. But when the humans can spread their stories by simply being anywhere they need, there's no need for story distribution systems. Why create a machine to send your story all over the world when you can just do it yourself, appearing wherever you want instantaneously? Those three elements of human development, goods, transit, and information, basically make up the fundamental needs that every invention ever aims to solve. All are nullified by teleportation. And yet, these inventions still exist in the Pokemon world as they do in the real world, largely unchanged. If anything, they're even more advanced in the Pokemon world than in the real one. There's technologies that can perfectly and losslessly convert matter, even life itself, into digital information instantly, allowing for those magical creatures to be found in the wild, captured and tamed in seconds, then converted into energy and sent to a worldwide storage system for access at any time. There's a lot of fundamentally disparate concepts here. Human nature isn't to innovate needlessly. We Terrans are wants to commit as little energy as possible to tasks as a group. The innovators have to work hard. But that's that's a drop in the bucket compared to the ease their inventions will have to the people that fund them. But taming Pokemon is easy. Training them is easy. The creation of fire, water, electricity, even life is easy. Why create a system of aqueducts across a city when you have a pet turtle capable of creating water out of thin air? Why create coal-fired power plants when this horse has a mane of fire? Why tame animals to carry machines for farming when this one literally grows all the food you could ever need on its neck? And with teleportation, each person person doesn't need a specific Pokemon for everything. Most will probably have, for themselves, some Pokemon for water and fire, as well as a Pokemon for teleportation. But the Pokemon for food can just live wherever they want, and the people can teleport to them. People don't need to create skyscrapers and sprawling cities when they can just borrow a desert Pokemon to build a new building from the Earth itself. All of this is well within the realm of possibility for Pokemon, but it isn't used. Instead, it's almost as if the biological kingdom of Pokemon was shoehorned into modern life as a replacement for animals without any consideration for the practicality of the world that was left. And that's the real answer. The world of Pokemon
Pokemon wasn't created thoughtfully or intelligently. It was created for a specific purpose, to let kids explore, catch Pokemon, and battle them without feeling too lost in this new world. Pokemon was created to be a game first, and the world is impossible because of it. It can be an interesting prospect to investigate fictional worlds with magic by imagining that the force of magic itself was instantaneously removed from the world and seeing how it would change. That way, we can see how fundamental magic is to the world, how intricately it was crafted into the fabric of the fictional reality. If you took the magic out of The Witcher, for example, you're going to see quite a bit of pain and loss. Most healers in the world are magic, and most governments employ witches in a sort of defense-slash-advisory-slash-espionage role to the leader. The institutions of monster parts, monster hunting, and raising those hunters would cease. The eponymous Witcher sect wouldn't exist anymore, nor were their charges the monsters. It's hard to say whether the lives of citizens would be better or worse for this. They'd be losing what little healing and medicinal power they had access to, but also have much less risk of being devoured by a creature. Regardless, their lives would be very, very different. It's worth noting that the forces of magic are, for the most part, relatively weak in the Witcher series. Magic takes a lot of exertion and effort to utilize, so even strong combat magic users like Geralt and Yennefer are quite limited. Teleportation magic is pretty rare, and though easy to use for people gifted with magic, is practically inaccessible to anyone other than the highest ranking government officers and their pet Witchers occasionally. Let's now take a look at Pokemon. How is that world different if we remove the magic. On the surface, the world would be majorly perturbed. The disappearance of Pokemon would mean that, aesthetically, the world would be very different. But as you dig deeper, most of the world is sustained by ordinary technology, not by Pokemon. Public transit is usually by train, with ordinary towns connected by ordinary roads and rails. Some transit does occur by Pokemon. Galar's Corviknight flying taxi service comes to mind. But the loss of this isn't exactly crippling to the region. Commerce and sales would take a financial hit from selling now useless objects that enhance the power of Pokemon, but would otherwise be unchallenged. Mining for resources is often aided by Pokemon, but not dependent on them. What few industries that do require Pokemon are those that facilitate Pokemon battling, trading, or maintenance. Pokemon research is usually aided by Pokemon, as is the Pokemon health sector. Most Pokemon professionals are dedicated to the existence of Pokemon battling, which would no longer exist. Battling does a lot for the economy of these regions, but it's an industry designed to be dominated by younger people. Most kids who become traders start young, around 10 years old and exit the battling circuits by their mid-twenties. Many adults, even young adults, fondly reminisce on their days of training past. Those adults who remain involved in the Pokemon world become academics or career battlers. Those industries would be wiped out, but the vast majority of battlers are children and teenagers, people plenty young enough to adapt to the new world. This, again, is to show the inauthenticity of the world. It wasn't created with the express purpose of being possible, and so it isn't. The world of Pokemon is flawed and paradoxical to its very core. It could not exist. So, the world of Pokemon is impossible. There is simply no way it could exist. We know that now. The magnitude of this issue is up for debate. If you're positively inclined towards the series in all aspects, it's very easy to overlook this as a design oversight that doesn't matter. After all, it is a series designed primarily for kids, and the stories of these games are simply insignificant to the games themselves. It's clear from playing the main series games that even at the height of their focus, the stories are really just thinly veiled excuses for the player to explore the world and catch some Pokemon. All of this is true, at least in part, but in my opinion, this is all true in spite of the many efforts that every single game in the main series makes against this. The people who script these experiences clearly want them to be these grandiose, epic experiences. There's been ample opportunities to scale back the scope of these stories. In the beginning, the stories were just about defeating the Pokemon League, thwarting the bad guys, and besting your rival. But, starting with Ruby and Sapphire, the stories became these sweeping affairs of organized criminals banding together to summon a deity like Pokemon in order to facilitate Apocalypse. Every non-remake game since those to, with the possible exception of the Black and White 2 stories, have had a main antagonist that wants to drastically change or end the world. Not only that, but the games also force every player to fully engage with the story by making these stories linear and require progression down that line, making story beats at every step of the way. There are unskippable cutscenes around every corner, so the player must be involved in the story. Despite the fact that these stories are riddled with adults and you play as a child under 13 in every single game, these apocalyptic plans are thwarted by you 
almost single-handedly. If these games didn't want people considering the storytelling important, then they should just make the stories unimportant to the world of Pokemon. But instead, we're constantly reminded of just how incredibly powerful and important Pokemon are in the world, how they have basically unchecked magical power in the world, and how it just so happens that they're subservient to humans. Isn't it lucky that there's typically a tenacious 10-year-old Titan Tamer to take down the terrorists? So, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to take some time to show how the world of Pokemon might look if the magic of Pokemon was taken seriously. I actually have been working on a story that takes place in this rendition of the Pokemon world, so if you're interested in a detailed video on my concept for Pokemon North and South, do let me know. But for now, let's just take some time to look at the world from the top down and see how it would have developed differently. First, the ground rules that I laid for myself. 1. This world has to be one in which the fundamental aspects of the games remain constant. Specifically, the practices of catching Pokemon and battling other trainers must exist basically unchanged. 2. The world is generally less malevolent than the real world. Pokemon abuse is not widespread. Battling for sport is pleasant for all involved parties, and the lives of humans are mostly happy. 3. We're assuming a world in which Pokemon take the place place of all and only animals. That means that they've existed from the beginning, that there were domestication efforts to tame and breed Pokemon, and that Pokemon remain fundamentally inferior to humans. 4. We ignore the magical abilities of certain humans. As we talked about briefly, there definitely are some people who are capable of magic on par with that of weak Pokemon. Some psychics and soothsayers that can make objects float, read minds, and predict future events. We're just going to ignore them for the purpose of this concept. With all that out of the way, let's look at some of the ways that the world would be be vastly different to the real world. Let's start small. What would the daily lives of the people in the Pokemon world look like? The unique trait of having magical animals is that the beasts of burden in the Pokemon world are actually capable of reproducing some of the modern phenomena of our world. Things like running water and toggleable lights probably would exist in this world, but would instead be powered by Pokemon. You can imagine that a house might have a Squirtle to summon water in a collection basin for the day's drinking and cooking. Meanwhile, a Magmar might work to light torches throughout the house, start cooking fires, and keep the home warm in the winter. The houses themselves, however, would probably be radically different to the way they are in our world. Because there are Pokemon capable of effortlessly shifting the ground, creating rocks, and manipulating metal, buildings would probably be stout earthy boxes. A workforce of Torteras would erect walls of the earth, and Empoleons would summon steel beams to reinforce them. Neighborhoods would be simple collections of ground boxes, friendly and quaint. In regions where the ground is less stable, like deserts or tundras, different materials might be used. Palisands could compact bricks of sand in the desert, brought to it by Flygons who summon sandstorms. Beartix and Glalies can be brought to the land by travelers to keep temperatures hospitable and to form ice to melt into water. Meanwhile, Galarian Darmanitan and Obama Snow can put aside their differences to build ice structures in the tundras, and Shiftry can build and care for specialized forests for logging, creating a fire source to be lit by embors. And these are the typical villages and settlements of the Pokemon world. Most people would live in these very small groups. Larger settlements would likely be unnecessary because of the way that many Pokemon are capable capable of teleporting themselves and their surroundings instantly to other locations. As we spoke about earlier, teleportation is the aspect of magic which would most dramatically alter the world in relation to our own. With energy-independent teleportation, concepts like travel, transportation, and even location become unimportant, almost meaningless. Cars and carts don't exist, roads and walkways don't exist. And teleportation is a skill that many relatively weak and common Pokémon have access to. If Pokémon capable of teleportation are easy to domesticate, then any settlement larger than a small village that probably existed from the time before Pokemon taming was widespread doesn't need to exist. We can imagine that farming, perhaps facilitated by Pokemon who are known to grow food on themselves like Tropius or Cherubi, might only happen in the region that is most comfortable to those Pokemon. Every person who needs food could instantly appear there using the powers of an Abra. Commerce and trade, if they exist at all, will probably consist of bartering. Currency, after all, is only a convenience. Coins and bills were made to be easier to carry around than the objects which equal them in value. With effortless teleportation, there's no need for currency to even exist. Widespread teleportation basically breaks most of the modern world. By invalidating those concepts of location and transportation, the world is left to be a sparse field of villages, individual residences, small storage areas, and farms. There's very little in the real world that wasn't built for the express purpose of being easy to access for trade and travel. From harbor cities being the biggest in the world, to river infrastructure, to even the 10-mile spacing between the smallest towns, everything was designed to be traveled between. All of this breaks with teleportation. Even 
even culture and religion would probably be radically different, if not mostly gone, since the worldwide spread of ideas could have happened much earlier in the Pokemon world than it did with the advent of the internet in the real world. With these very small settlements, nature-focused lives, and location independence, humanity would probably be much quieter and more resilient than it is in the real world. Wars for resources and land would be non-existent because, again, those things don't matter. With the capabilities of many Pokemon easily extending to the creation of energy, water, and life, there's no reason that any part of the world would be any less valuable or inhabitable than any other. The homes of many people may look different depending on the nearby terrain, but lives would all be very similar. This answer is boring. It assumes that there is no other reason for proximity and collaboration than convenience of transit. While I personally think that the primary driving force of culture, society, and life in our world is the way that location and travel works, and most of this video relies on that being true, let's take a moment to assume that the people will gather into large settlements anyway. Maybe teleportation is weaker than it seems to be in the games, or those Pokemon capable of facilitating it are more powerful and more difficult to domesticate and use than it seems. Let's modify our assumptions to say that teleportation is much more difficult to use, being mainly used by large groups of people who can dedicate large sects to domesticating and utilizing these Pokemon, while also imagining that these Pokemon are considerably less common than we previously thought, thus making them exclusively tools for governments to establish and use. We make these specific modifications in order for us to get what we might call interesting results. That is, we get society again, but this time with magic. What we will now start to see is the sprawling city, but much more alive than cities ever were in the real world. This is not a metaphor. Many Pokemon are capable of creating and growing massive trees and plants, so the largest cities would probably live in the hearts of forests. Skyscrapers would be the most magnificent trees, grown in a way that makes the innermost parts of the trunk incredibly stable, with waterproof leaves and branches that curve out and in atop each tree, weaving together to make natural roofs. Imagine a city where enormous Torterras host colonies of pollinators like Combi, Burmy, Beautifly, and more on their backs. These are the construction companies of this world. These build buildings would be carved around the extremely stable core of the trunk, making the tree look like a thin pole supporting many discs of wood where the people would make their homes and workplaces. All of this would not be lit by fire, obviously, but by Pokemon that can create non-fire lighting, like Illumis and Volby. Roads would probably still be dirt, or they may be paved with stone. Dugtrio and Exadrill might mine for stone underground and bring it to the surface for Conkeldor, Tyranitar, and Steelix to manipulate into roads. Gogoats and Mudsdales would pepper the roads, carrying people and goods around the city. The enormous tree buildings would probably be relatively far from each other in order to have the proper space and nutrients to grow, so intermediate structures made of earth and wood would line the streets. Surrounding these cities would be lots of farmland. This land would not be rows of crops, but land for grazing. Since several Pokemon are capable of growing food for humans and other Pokemon on their bodies, these would be bred and housed in these farms. Councils of Ninetales and Torkoal would ensure that the sun is shining whenever it needs to, in order to ensure that food grows and that people stay happy. In locales without ample forests, we see structures that rely on the magic of psychic Pokemon in order to keep them stable and standing. Towering sandstone structures would be created by Hippowdon, then stabilized by the telekinetic forces of Alakazam. Unovan, Darmanitan, and Magmar would be able to smelt sand into glass to create windows and beauty in these cities. Stony aqueducts would be powered by blastoise around the city, allowing for life and transit. These cities might even appear more magical than the forest cities, with structures of impossible heights, maybe even levitating above the ground, being made possible due to the necessity of Pokemon with telekinesis to support the city. Through this, we can see that this world is both hugely different to ours, but also worth visiting and exploring for people who are visitors to it, the people who are playing the games that feature them. I've tried to steer clear of too many specific examples since, as I mentioned, I've been developing a world and story with this second set of limitations in mind. But hopefully, you can see that the magic of the Pokemon world is not impossible to work with, but simply needs a world built around it, rather than shoehorning Pokemon into a world resembling our own. Of course, there are problems with this kind of world. Many Pokemon are designed to imitate or even inhabit technologies and artifacts that simply wouldn't exist. How would a Rotom work? Would Porygon be able to exist? How about resurrected fossil Pokemon? There's many holes that can be poked in this concept, and that's okay. I'm not trying to fix Pokemon, since it doesn't really need to be fixed. The franchise and the world works perfectly well as is. I'm just interested in the opportunity to think critically about the storytelling and world building of the Pokemon 
world as an important milestone for the Pokemon franchise is crossed. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are nearly here. They look like they're going to be great games, and I'll certainly be playing Scarlet. Despite my fiery influence, I'm a grass boy, so I'll be conquering Paldea on the back of my Sprigatito. And, of course, I'll be enjoying them regardless of their impossibility. This is probably an aspect of the Pokemon franchise that isn't worth criticizing, since it doesn't really matter to very many people. But, as someone who's obsessed with storytelling and world building, I've wanted to talk about this for a long time. I hope I've been able to get you to think about your own Pokemon journey, or, at the very least, to enjoy a Pokemon critique that focuses on an aspect of the franchise that goes ignored by most everyone else. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know that if you've watched my last video, then you probably noticed how different this one is. I hope that's okay. Creating video essays of all kinds on the games I love is really what I aim to do. So there's likely to be a wide variety of gaming adjacent subjects and contents here on the channel. Also, apologies for taking so long to make this video. I have a bad habit of underestimating the scale of projects, and this video was no exception. I set several deadlines for myself, all of which I missed. The most obvious one is that this video was made with the intention of dropping before Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, which clearly didn't happen. That's why there's only a little footage of those games, and why most of it is from Sword and Shield and Legends Arceus. No deadline for the next video this time, but hey, this video only took 5 months as opposed to 2 years, so that's market improvement. If you'd like to be the first to see what I make next, please subscribe to the channel. I've got some big things in the works. Finally, a big thank you to the people you see on screen now. Well, except for this guy. He's a pizza. That's all I've got for today. Enjoy your day, and take care.